genius of a suspension bridge is that you can hang the bridge from above, but then of course that raises a whole new set of challenges. How do you hang a bridge from above? Well, you have to begin with towers. Engineers use huge towers on either end of the bridge to suspend a flat roadway from arcing cables, which are encased in 60,000 ton stone blocks called anchorages on either shore. Smaller cables called suspenders hang down from the main cables and hold up the roadway. The heavy weight of the road pulls down on the cables, but the anchorages keep the cables pulled taut, holding the road up. The combined forces push down on the towers, compressing them into a solid, rigid mass. Since the towers, cables, and anchorages do all the work of holding up the roadway, additional pillars underneath aren't needed, keeping the river clear. It's an ingenious way to make a bridge, and it also sort of seems to defy nature because there doesn't seem to be any way that it's being held up. Before now, no one has dared use these engineering marvels to cross a river this wide. The Brooklyn Bridge's center span will need to be over 1,500 feet, 50% longer than any suspension bridge ever built, connecting City Hall in Manhattan with downtown Brooklyn. It seems like an impossible job. But one man in America is up to the challenge, a civil engineer named John Augustus Roebling. Even at one of the river's narrowest points, the bridge will require a center span that will stretch a staggering 1,595 and a half feet. He will need 14,000 miles of wire to make the four main cables it hangs from. To hold all that up, he designs towers of stone taller than almost every building in the city. But then, tragedy strikes. In 1869, while making final sightings for the bridge, Roebling's foot is crushed by a ferry slamming into its slip. His toes are amputated, and he dies soon after of an infection. One of the largest engineering projects ever attempted is in turmoil. But salvation is found close to home. His son, Washington A. Roebling, must take his father's place as chief engineer. Finally, the massive effort is ready to begin. On January 3, 1870, the first of a workforce that would reach nearly 1,000 men report to duty. Their first challenge is to erect the massive Gothic arches that will one day become one of the bridge's most iconic features. But their foundations must rest on solid ground at river bottom to be sturdy. That means Roebling must somehow send men up to 80 feet underwater to dig away the riverbed down to bedrock. Roebling turns to a risky new device, an open-bottomed box of wood and iron called a caisson. Pneumatic caissons are basically large boxes that are placed upside down so that what would normally be the bottom of a box is up at the top and the open bottom is facing down into the water. Sunk to the bottom of the river, highly pressurized air is pumped into the open area, forcing the water out. Men climb inside through airlocks to work in the cramped, pressurized space. Some compare it to hell, unbearably hot and humid, in danger from both fire and drowning. Men spend a year toiling in these caissons, digging away at a rate of more than a foot per day at the riverbed beneath them. It was a challenge like no one had ever taken on before. Every day they would go down there through airlocks and dig with picks and shovels and slowly but surely go down through the riverbed down to bedrock. But the pressurized air that keeps the water out also leads to a mysterious sickness. 